Let's build a patio furniture set from scratch for my parents, also known as the project where I almost respirate a caterpillar, but more on that later. So to get started, I got all of my cedar together and removed the staples before I ran them through the planer so that the staples don't go flying. And then a little hack for you, if you have to clean up nails or screws or staples like this, and you don't have to pick up every single one individually, just put a magnet on the end of a string and move it around and it grabs all of them off the ground. Then I ran the cedar through my planer and you don't really need to do this if you're able to find smooth lumber, but when when I went to the store, I could only find rough cedar. So it had to all get planed, which is annoying and adds a lot of steps to this process, but it is really satisfying to watch that rough cedar run through and turn out smooth at the other end. I just love it. And then another hack for you, if you have a bunch of sawdust at the end and you're worried about it, you know, spontaneously combusting and setting your house on fire, then just add some water to it in the bag like I do here, bag it up and put it in your trash can. Once I had all of my lumber smooth, then I started cutting it to size. And I'm using some plants that I found online and it told me exactly how long to cut these individual pieces to, which made things super simple. A little hack for you, if you're cutting long pieces of wood like this and you need to support the other side, I just put two pieces of scrap two by four underneath the other end and that supported it while I made my cut. Then once I got everything cut to size, I went to my table saw and this is where I cleaned up the sides that were still rough and I also made my own two by twos. Obviously you can just buy two by twos, but it's hard to find in cedar and even when you do find a two by two, it's really hard to find a straight one. I find that they're often bent or twisted. So I just cut my own from some straight lumber and then got it cut to size. And then I got started with building the legs. Now this was interesting to learn because this is a kind of woodworking that I haven't done before. So you use a spade bit to create this one inch wide hole. And note to self, remember to always clamp when using a spade bit or a hole saw because I always forget to do this and tweak my wrist and it's not fun. So use a clamp and then use two hands on your drill. It'll be so much easier. Once I had these one inch holes drilled, then I used a sander to just remove any of the excess splinters. And and then this is kind of how this construction works. So what this allows you to do is create a hole further through so that you can hide your screw inside. So in this big hole, I drilled a small hole for the screw and then I drive in my screws. Then what you do to seal this up is you take some wood glue, you add it to the hole and then you cut some pieces of one inch dowel. I used an oak dowel since it's a nice hardwood and then you just pop that into the hole. And you'll probably want to use a rubber mallet for this, but I didn't have it with me. It was at my parents' house. So I used a hammer. You just have to be really careful because you can dent the wood pretty easily. And then you hammer the plugs into place and you would cut off the excess, but here is when I discovered the first problem. So the plans that I used called for using three inch screws here, but if you do the math, that actually only leaves about half an inch of that screw in the piece of wood below, which is definitely not enough, which means that I needed to use longer screws. And that also means that I have to first remove these dowels that I just glued and put in place with tension. So I had to figure out how to do this. I used the drill, I used the hammer, I used some pliers. I resorted to a chip chisel, but thankfully later I was able to salvage this piece even though it looked crazy on one side. I just flipped it over and did the same holes on the other side, nice and clean. This time I used four inch screws and some glue on the other side just to make sure. And this ended up being super secure. So if you follow these plans, use four inch screws instead. So here's what it looks like when you put that dowel in place properly, you put a little glue on it and then you hammer or mallet it in, get it as far in as you can, and then use a saw to remove the excess. And I'm using a Japanese saw. And if you've never used it before, it's amazing and really easy to use, especially if other kind of hand saws feel really unruly. So I repeated that on all of the other holes that I had to plug, got everything looking nice and clean and flush. And then I went with my sander just to get all the little splinters and things off the dowel parts and get everything nice and smooth. From there on the legs, there was this bottom span that I had to add in. And clamps are really your best friend, especially if you're doing a project alone. So invest in clamps, they really do help a lot. And most of the rest of this project is pocket hole construction. So if you have a pocket hole jig, this will be really simple for you. Once I got the legs built, it was time to attach it together. And this is the sofa part of the patio set. And of course, while I'm doing this, a storm had to roll in. I know it's not technically summer yet, but this is kind of how our summers go in Texas. Really random heavy rain all of a sudden, and then it clears up and is sunny and beautiful again, just in time for me to add all these slats in. Once I got these nice and secure, it was time to transfer this to my car so I could take it to my parents' house. And um, at this point, this thing weighed so much, probably at least the weight of four, four by fours, carrying them all together. And then I have my supervisors there, of course, making sure that I am watching my feet and hopefully tripping over them. And I got it loaded up in my car, except it wouldn't fit in all the way. So I kind of had to drive with it all the way to my parents' house with it hanging open. Fortunately, it did make it. Then I assembled the back of the sofa. Again, this is all just pocket holes. So once you figure out how to do pocket holes and attach them, this is a pretty simple build. Got the back together, moved it to my parents' house and did the final assembly there. Tapped it in place with my foot as one does. And then I used some 
clamps, which I promptly tripped over as soon as I put it on and used my mallet, which I was finally reunited with to make some minor adjustments. The plans specify a very specific length that it needs to be from the front to the back, as well as a specific angle. So for the angle, I used my angle finder, also known as a miter protractor, and then used my mallet just to make some adjustments to get that angle just right. I attached everything to the back, which is some simple screws and did the same thing on the other side to get it nice and even. Now the final step for this was adding the seat slats to the bottom of the sofa. They were a bit rough, so I started by sanding them first. And this is when I felt something very strange in my respirator. It felt like a wiggling, tickling thing. Get this off me right now. What is this? Pulled it off, looked inside, and in the midst of all of my sweat, what else was there? Oh, fun. Yeah, a caterpillar. And I had been sanding for like five minutes at this point, and it had only finally emerged from wherever it was hiding. So yeah, put it safely away and then uh, continued the rest of the assembly without the respirator. And this is when I discovered another issue with the plans. So it calls for only three of these slats, but there is a big gap at the back otherwise that needs to be filled. So I measured how big that needs to be. Fortunately, I had another piece I was able to go back and rip on the table saw, put that in place, and then secured everything down with a bunch of wood screws. And that was the finished sofa. And then I moved on to building the chair, which is just a kind of shrunk down version of the sofa. So at this point, it felt really easy because I already knew how to construct it. Follow the same exact steps for the sides and supports, moved it to my parents' house for the final construction when I found, oh yeah, what is that? Another caterpillar. That's right. They are everywhere right now. And I do mean everywhere. And I am all for pollinators. I love them, but I do need some personal space. And I also don't want to accidentally squish them while I'm working on a project. So they had to go. And then I attached the back. And this one I did not need to clamp because it was such a tight fit, which was actually really nice. So I just used my mallet to tap it into place. Here's a closer look at what it looks like to use the miter protractor to get that correct angle. And the challenge here is getting both the correct angle and the correct distance at the same time. So I had to make a couple different adjustments until I got both at the same time. And then I was able to secure everything at the back with some wood screws. The final piece of the three piece patio set is the coffee table. And if you've ever dreamed about building a table before, the good thing to know is like once you build one, even just a coffee table, it's the same general construction for larger tables too. So if you wanna get your feet wet, here is how you do it. So this one uses a lot of pocket holes for construction. You start by assembling the legs. Again, clamps are super helpful here. And then you get your legs lined up and then you can add on the apron pieces. And by apron, it just means the long pieces that connect the legs on the sides. And the thing with pocket holes is just to remember, try to hide the pocket holes as much as you can. These plans do outline how to place the wood so that the pocket holes are always hidden, which is really nice. So that is the base, fully complete. And now we just have to build the tabletop. And to do that, I ripped down some wood on the table saw to make sure that the sides were nice and flush because they need to join up perfectly together. And sometimes when you buy your wood from the store, the sides are a little wonky. And I used wood glue and pocket hole construction. And of course, lots of clamps to put this together. There are four boards along the top. And once that was done, I just added some more clamps everywhere because I wanted it to be extra tight while the glue dried. And if you ever wonder how hot it gets in Texas during June, just take a look here. I am not a big sweater too. So it's rough out here. After the glue is completely dry, I removed my clamps and then the edges were just a little bit off. And that's pretty common if you're laminating wood together like this. So I just used my circular saw to clean up that edge, make it nice and straight. I did that for both sides. And then there are these side pieces that you add on to the table. Just use some wood glue and pocket holes again to construct this. Clamps are always helpful. Flipped it over and it looked pretty good, but it wasn't perfectly even and it was too big to put in my planner. So I used my sander to get all that nice and flush. And the other thing I did was I noticed that there were some just little gaps and cracks that happened and I filled those with wood glue. I put sawdust on top. I kind of pressed that in, let it dry just a little bit and then went over it with the sander. And the sander helps to create even more sawdust that fills in that wood glue and creates this really nice seal where there was a gap before. The other thing I did differently than the plans is that I used figure eight fasteners to attach the tabletop which is something I do for all the tables I build. And what these do is that they allow for wood movement because it will expand and contract, especially since this furniture is gonna be outside. And if you just attached it with normal screws, otherwise it would split the wood that you just laminated. These figure eight fasteners though allow for nice little movement from side to side without an issue. I just mark where they go and then I use a Forstner bit to make the cutout that the figure eight fastener fits into. It needs to be flush with the surface or a little bit below the surface of that wood. Here's a closer look at what that looks like. So from there, I added in my screw 
through and I got that nice and tightened down. But here's the thing, you wanna make sure there's a little bit of wiggle. I could not wiggle this here, so I knew I needed to back out this screw just a tiny bit. And I don't want it loose, but I do want it to be able to move side to side with a little bit of pressure, which it does now, and this is perfect. Set this to the side, I laid down the tabletop upside down, and then this is how you attach the tabletop to the base. So on the other side of the figure eight, this is where you put your new screws in that attach the tabletop, and that's what keeps it nice and secure. Once I had everything transferred to my parents' house, then I started prepping it for stain. So I first water pot, which means that I just rub down all the surfaces with water to help raise the grain. It roughs up the texture as it dries, and then I can sand it nice and smooth. And that means that when I apply my stain later, it'll stay smooth. And this time, of course, I checked my respirator very carefully before I put it on, sanded everything down. And then for my stain, I used a combination of two different stains that I used on my rocking chairs that I ended up liking a lot. Cedar naturally wants to look more orange, but I found that this combination just helps to mellow it out just a little bit. I'm finally working on the paint touch-ups around the porch. I had to go get some more of this paint though first, and it was a perfect match, thankfully, because I had to guess on the sheen. And then I touched up down here on the siding where I got some cement stain on it, got that all nice and clean looking again. And then I got all this very, very heavy furniture now in place. I actually used some sanding pads underneath, if you can see that, and it helped it slide really easily. So recommend if you need that in a pinch. And because I didn't put anything down to protect the ground while I was staining, I just cleaned up the stain here and then added some touch-ups and no one will be able to know. Got everything in place, added the final cushions. And here's a reminder of what this space looked like before. And here is what it looks like now. I love this patio set. I love how it turned out. I love the color. I love the cushions. I love how heavy and substantial it is. This is really gonna last forever and I think my parents are gonna love it.